Hi, and welcome to The Working Songwriter, the show where today's best songwriters come to talk shop. I'm your host, Joe Pug. Each episode here, we host a distinguished guest, and we ask them to go deep on their inspiration, on their process, on the general ups and downs of making a life in music. So, whether you're a grizzled veteran touring in Japan, because that's the only market where they released the direct-to-cassette action movie that you scored in 1979, or else a scrappy upstart touring in Akron, Ohio, because that's the only market where your sludge metal EP has received a single stream on Spotify. This is your show, because ultimately it is what every writer seeks most, an ironclad excuse to put off actually writing. Hey everybody, it's the last Friday of November 2019, and I'm glad that you're here. This month's episode is brought to you by Banzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. I am old enough to remember when you had to pay somebody called a web developer to get a website made, and it would be some guy named Aiden who drove a Honda Element with a system of a down bumper sticker on it. He'd wear a uh, Von Dutch visor, and Aiden would be openly derisive of your music while he built your website. And then he would charge you like a thousand bucks for a site that was obsolete in six months. But it's the future now. We don't have to put up with his smug, passive aggressive demeanor anymore. We have nice things now. We have Banzoogle. Banzoogle powers the websites of tens of thousands of musicians from around the world, from weekend warriors to Grammy winners. All the features you need for a professional website are already built in. Hosting and a custom domain name, dozens of fully customizable design templates, mailing list tools, social media integrations, a crowdfunding feature, which lets you crowdfund your next project commission-free. It's all great. So go over there to Banzoogle, type in code TWS, that's the initials to our show, TWS, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. Thank you. Banzoogle for supporting the working songwriter. Okay, um, I hope you guys had a happy Thanksgiving. God knows I did. I just finished all my touring for the year. Um, Australia was really, really fun. Thank you to everyone who made it out to a show down there, Um, music listeners and podcast listeners alike. Thank you very much. Um, If you'd like to hear some of my music live, I'm going to be playing a bunch in the spring in 2020. Um, The only dates that we have announced, though, are February 7th, at Levon Helms Barn with uh, Bonnie Light Hortzman. And then in early March, I'm playing the 930 Club with the Little Smokies. All the other um, dates are going to be posted soon, so keep an eye out for those. I'll be all over the East Coast in the States. Um, finally, if you enjoy this podcast, if you'd like to help it remain a viable endeavor for me, there's a couple things that you could do to help out. Firstly, you could become a supporter of the show over at Patreon. Um, that's a site where you can directly support projects that you find meaningful. You just head over to Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, type in my name or the name of this show, The Working Songwriter, and then you sign up to kick in a few bucks every month, the price of a cup of coffee or something like that, uh, something that you won't miss um, to help the show keep rolling. And if that's not your uh, if that's not your vibe, if you're not in a place where you feel like kicking in some dough, I totally get that. There's a couple of things that you could do for uh, free. First, you could leave us a rating in the iTunes store. That's free. Uh, or even freer than that, you could just you could tell a friend about the show. Spread the word about the show. Tell people who you think might dig it. That helps us big time. And uh, the simple math with those two things, leaving a rating and telling a friend, is that they will help me much more than they will be a pain in the ass for you. So thank you for um, helping the show in any way. Thank you for listening. I'll end all the harassment there, and I'll leave you to this really enjoyable episode that I taped with Elizabeth Cook. I hope I get to be her friend after this because she is, uh, as you'll hear from this interview, just a um, a delight and so smart, um, so savvy on the business end of things, and uh, this was really fun. I learned a lot, and I hope you do too. Peace.
My guest this month is a native of Wildwood, Florida, who's made her home in Nashville for the last few decades. Elizabeth Cook has spent 20 years carving out a singular career in music and entertainment. She's released five critically acclaimed records and has performed over 400 times at the Grand Old Opry. She hosts her own wildly popular radio program on XM's Outlaw Channel entitled Elizabeth Cook's Apron Strings. And she's a regular guest on Cartoon Network's cult country classic, Squidbillies. She's also a personal favorite of comedy icon David Letterman, who in 2012 tapped her to be a guest on his show and opted to interview her on the couch, which was a very unusual opportunity for his musical guests. She's recorded for Atlantic Records and 30 Tigers. The New York Times has called her a, quote, sharp and surprising country singer. NPR has dubbed her a treasure of the Americana singer-songwriter scene, and Rolling Stone bestowed a title upon her. She is, according to them, the hippie hillbilly queen of East Nashville. It was a delight to talk with Elizabeth as she was at home with her dog hanging out, um, and I thank her for taking the time to sit down with our plucky little program. We did it. Yeah, so yeah. All right, let's see if I can get this thing, keep this thing from falling. I'm on Merle Haggard's iPad. How did you get Merle Haggard's iPad? Um, because there's this uh, DJ out in Bakersfield. You may know him. His name's Scott Cox, and uh, he was like an assistant of Merle's or something. And he, when Merle died, he was like, he got really into your album Welder right before he died. Oh, okay. And um. And we got him an iPad so he could use the Bluetooth on the bus. And uh, she's like, so, you know, if you'd like to have that. And, you know, I was like, yeah. <laughs> they scrubbed it. But I got, uh, anyway, I have got like a little Belkin keyboard and stuff. And it saved my butt because my iPad was so old and crappy. Did you ever get to meet uh, Merle Haggard? Or just his yeah, iPad? I you opened did? for him a few times. Really? Where early on. Early on. Well, like when... Like when I had like mainstream music row record deals, mm -hmm. but, and I was more like considered like traditional country, but nobody was really doing that. So I got, yeah. I ended up getting the booking agents that had like the older country stars, right? you know, so like Bobby Roberts agency and, and these do. So I would like go out and open, you know, from Raw Haggard, which was awesome for the resume. But the reality of it was, you know, I was in front of like, a thousand really old people in Iowa or whatever, you know? Right. So as good as it was as a bragging point um, in terms of like, you know, getting my career to catch hold at all. The only thing that mattered then was country radio and that wasn't happening. So there are some opening gigs where you can be playing in front of all the people in the world, but you can just tell while you're up there, you're like, not a single person is going to come to my club gig next time right. I'm here in Dubuque or whatever. Right. Yeah, not that you know. kind of music consumers. It's like, yeah, I know. I uh, know. And you end up playing the concession line. Like, I know, poops, you know, somebody's like, oh, I got I got on the whatever, Toby Keith tour. I'm opening for Tom Petty's opener. And I was like, man, you're going to be playing in the popcorn line. <laughs> you really are. You really One time I, I did an opening tour, and I won't say uh, who this band was for, but it was a month-long tour, and we had signed up for it. And I knew on night one, like two songs in, I'm like, this isn't going to fucking work this at all. And we had a month ahead of us. It was so bad. <laughs> oh my god! Oh. So that would have first. <laughs> that would have been around the turn of the century. Then for you, then that's when you had um, your first deal was with like a a big record label. That would have been like around two thousand, two thousand one. Yeah, Atlantic. So I, my very first record was nineteen ninety nine. It was at like an indie country record, but I was firmly planted in on music. Right, like I had a publishing deal, but it was sort of with this like little sect of the, it was sort of the underbelly of music row, but the like really cool guys, like we were um, East squared Steve Earl's record label was on the second floor and we were on the third floor of the old Warner brothers building. It was, it's gone now. It's not down. It was only three stories high, but those guys, like they had Towns Van Zant's catalog and they introduced me to like Lucinda Williams and people that I had never heard of. And, uh, and really tried to, 
you know, just by proxy of what they genuinely liked and represented introduced me to a deeper level of songwriters. And I think I called it like there used to be room for singer songwriters on major labels in Nashville, you know, Rodney Crow and Steve Earle and all these people were on major labels. Yeah. But then when the money grab started happening, they just wanted, you know, people with massive radio hits or nothing. They were not going to spend any money. So when you say that money grab, when did that started happening and why was there a reason, like a technical reason why it started happening then and not earlier? There's a couple of factors at play. This is all my theory, by the way. That's well, um, that's why I'm interviewing you. I want to hear yeah, your theory. Okay. In 1996, um, Bill Clinton signed a law that deregulated communications companies. And basically, to, to my understanding, Clear Channel and Westwood One, I think were the main two, they scooped up every radio station in every market. And then they began to, with a really regimented way, um, this station is for this demographic, and we sell advertising here. This station is for this demographic. It got so drilled down to the point of, like, they wanted music at certain DB levels. Um, they would only play things that basically served as white noise between ads. Nothing polarizing at all. So it has to, like, validate the identity of whoever's listening and not disturb them in any way. So they just don't want you to change it all. Right. Um, so that way they can, they they sell advertising. That's what they're in the business of doing. So uh, that was unfortunate. And then that began the payola system really, really got ugly then. So I saw all that happen. And then the other component, I think, was CDs. You know, CDs were so cheap to make. And they were selling them at like $25 a pop. I know, yes. And yeah. they were since I mean literally since so and then come like arena country acts like Garth Brooks and High Twain I mean the money was nuts and everybody was just blinded with greed it seemed like and the people that cared whether or not Kelly Willis had a record deal and Nancy Griffith had a record deal and the Steve Earls and the Rodney Crowles and the Guy Clarks and and the executives or gatekeepers or whatever just got so fat and greedy or blinded by being crazy rich or that they just got their eye off the cause and the care about nurturing the art form and making sure that was in a healthy state and that and then Napster and all that stuff was happening like they were completely oblivious that the internet was happening <laughs> you know and they have every resource in the world to you know to get ahead of that to own that you know insane. yeah it's insane um so I, I sort of saw those things happen. I was definitely, and I definitely, I think it was very clear that I wasn't going to play ball, that I wasn't going to play along. Um, so when with, you say you weren't going to play ball, I mean, you know, you, I almost think of a movie like Wayne's World where you have like the asshole a and executive coming in and, and, you know, trying to massage different songs in different ways. What did it look like on, on just like a day-to-day -day basis? How did that manifest itself when you were working? Were people coming into the studio? Were they making you write with other people? How was that manifesting itself? Well, I only made one major label record, and that was supposed to be for Atlantic. Um, in the Time Warner AOL merger, which was also super exciting, um, Warner Brothers obtained like six labels in Nashville. Like All the rosters got absorbed in. They cut everybody... They cut from 47 acts down to 16. They kept me, which was a bizarre choice. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if Barry Coburn, who had signed me to Atlantic, who was now out of a job, um, was instrumental. They were also instructed to leave me alone until I was finished making the record. Okay. I had a really hard time with the producer, so that ended up being really difficult. It was convenient for them. Like, great, one we don't have to deal with. But um, So what was the I, hard was time that you had with the producers? Do what? What was the hard time you were having with the producers? His wife. His wife was, <laughs> Whoa. Having, was having an affair. I, I mean, as much as I have struggled with men in this industry, I have struggled with the women of those men in this <laughs> industry. Um, it has not been handy. Um, you know, it'll get you in the door, but then they'll shut it behind you. Sure. <laughs> um, so that it was bizarre. I was engaged to be married. Mm -hmm. I was like 26. My parents were always with me. I could not have been more naive. Sure. And 
you know, not, this is like, my producer was like a chubby British guy, you know, it was like <laughs> not on the table. And I was like engaged and, you know, it, I don't know. It was really weird. So that was going on. And then Warner Brothers, they released my record. I don't know why. I don't know why they did it. They kind of, th I think there's also the tax shelter happens, like they bury money so they can, you know, if they spent $75,000 on a video for me, which they did. Yeah. Yes. And, and they know they're not going to, they know they're not going to throw down the money that it was going to take to, um, sorry, my dog's starting to show up, but I'll feed him. You're too. good. You're good. Um, they, they knew they weren't going to throw down the money that it takes to ante up at country radio. Cause that shit's expensive. So I would be in the car with the pro promotion guy who'd say, if you'll move faith Hill up in rotation, we will fly your family home for Thanksgiving and buy you a new TV so you can watch the Faith Hill Thanksgiving special on TV. Just blatant. Just blatant. While we're wow. riding around in a Cadillac Escalade, I'm opening for, which I'm sure is getting billed back to me. Sure. I'm opening for Leanne Womack. And they are just like dropping me at the gig and then taking radio guys to strip clubs. Wow. Just straight, ugly, like... It was gross. It was gross. Wow. So from every single way I turned, it was just like, just gaggingly gross. And and then the musically, uh, that wasn't jiving either. And um, yeah, I was, Blake Shelton and I were like kind of aligned. Mm -hmm. And he was the guy that would go down to the label every day mm -hmm. and hang out and crack jokes and go to lunch and write with, you know, Clint and Trent and who the hell ever. And I just was tormented by it all. And I was staying home in my apartment, smoking a ton of weed and writing weird songs about, you know, sex dreams with Satan and all this stuff. And so it was just, no. And it took me so long to to navigate my way out of those deals, you know. What do you think it is about your background and yourself and the way that you grew up that made you not be... Um, what Blake Shelton was doing and, and be yourself. Like what was the road that took you to that more iconoclastic outlook? I don't, I don't n know for sure. But one thing that I could say is that I'm not, I don't think I'm motivated by the same things. Mm -hmm. What, are you, what are you motivated by? I like to feel like I've done good work. I like to write a great lyric. I like to deliver it and have it land. I like to execute it musically in a really effective, powerful way. And that's something I'm always chasing. Um, so that's led me to a lot of more like subversive topics and, and things that even though I'm a country singer all day long, if you ask me, um, but they have such a narrow brand now that, and even then it was starting to happen that, you know, definitely was not, and as a woman too, not squeaky clean enough, not on message, um, didn't wear, didn't want to wear the clothes. Um, I, I made a seventies country record in 2002. Like nobody wanted to hear that then. They want to hear it now. They want to hear it now. I know you were, you were ahead of the now. curve, Elizabeth. I, I, I so far ahead, I'm behind. That's what I say. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about, uh, because uh, people who aren't familiar with, with you uh, of this podcast, they might think that, well, you just moved to Nashville because you had a publishing deal waiting for you there and this, that, and the other, but couldn't be farther from the truth. You moved there for a totally different job and kind of walked into the back door of the music industry. How did that work for you? Yeah. I mean, I came up with my mom and dad being musicians and their dream for me was to be a country singer. I went to college. They did not understand that choice at all. Oh, they wow. wanted to be Reba McIntyre. My mother thought, you're not pinned down with a husband and kids and you're 18 and like, what are you, you're going to do what? Like college is for rich people, you know, not something we really did, but I made good grades. And also the music lifestyle that I had been exposed to was rough and scary for a little girl, um, bars and, and fights and alcoholism and, you know, infidelity and domestic abuse, all the gnarly stuff. And so I didn't have a good association with it. I grew up doing it. I, I love to sing. I love to, you know, try and write a little bit. I loved being creative any way I could be creative. 
Mm -hmm. anyway. Um, but I didn't want to do it for a living. I, I just didn't want to be around it anymore. So I got a degree in accounting and computer information systems. Wow. You ran in exactly the opposite direction. So were you heading to gigs with your parents uh, all the time as, as a kid to play with them? Or were you just there while they performed and there wasn't a babysitter to go to otherwise? How did that work? Yeah. Well, up until I was eight, um, mm -hmm. when I was about four or five is where I start remembering band practices at our house. Yeah. Um, and, and the bar gigs. And sometimes there was a babysitter and sometimes there wasn't. And I went. Um, and I, I had 10 siblings that were all half brothers and sisters, but they were older than me and doing their own thing. So I was pretty alone. And I would just be around like middle aged adults in a bar and they doted on me, you know, sure. but it was still like not really the environment <laughs> that that you want um for that so i went to that but then when i when i turned eight my mama was really really good um and she wrote really good country songs and she wrote this song called for me called does my daddy love the bottle more than he loves me <laughs> and it was the b-side of my first 45 record that i made yeah. um in the 80s and i still have it on vinyl oh that's awesome and uh my daddy quit drinking he quit drinking and then, and then it was really ugly for a long time because he had to deal with the shit, <laughs> um, yeah. you know, and that was a whole nother chapter that was difficult in a different way. Um, so at that point when I was eight, they made a project out of me gotcha. and, and I started making records and they got me a band so they could still be around it, but they weren't in the bar. So I would sing at the feed and seed opening. I would sing, um, at a crafts fair in Orlando, I would, you know, they would take me or had a little PA, um, and it was mortifying for me. I absolutely hated it. Really? Um, I don't, and I still don't love, I'm much more at ease with it now, but I was never one to like that kind of attention. I'm just not that kid that's like, jazz hands, look at me. I'm going to bust a move in the living room for everybody. You know, I was never that kid, More, way more shy. And, and so I didn't like performing at all. So, I mean, to me, you going through that and then deciding at 18 that I'm going to go study accounting, that's like a middle finger to your parents. Like you're pissed at your parents at that point, right? I, I mean, I really did it when I was 12. I told them and they had invested so much. I still have the cowgirl costumes. Mm -hmm. The old PV speakers that were the P PA are actually my bedside tables because they look really cool. Um but when I was 12 and I had uh, made a best friend in school and she and I wanted to try out for cheerleading. And if we tried out for cheerleading, I was going to be busy on the weekends with football and cheerleading mm -hmm. stuff. And so I just went to them and told them. And I remember it feeling kind of solemn, but they also respected my choice and didn't bad enough. Good for them. Yeah, they were very sweet. They they didn't understand the college thing, but um I think they didn't know how I was going to pay for it, <laughs> and I didn't either. <laughs> well, I mean, it sounds like you're at peace with their role in, in the way that they raised you uh, now at this point in your life, but was there a time when you resented the way that they raised you like that? No. Um, we were always, I mean, my father and I had our moments, mm -hmm. but for the most part, we were always super close, tight-knit, loving family. That's right. They... Um, they doted on me. They loved me. Um, I could, you know, do anything um, that I wanted to do, and they would love me. They just wanted to be close. They always wanted to be close, so we stayed close. And, um, you know, I never told I was sitting with a therapist um, after they had passed that, you know, and he said to me, he's like, you got used, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and that I talked about all the horrific some really horrific instances, um, almost laughingly, like they were funny stories in our family. And he was like, that's horrible that that happened. If you think about six-year-old you, you know, mm -hmm. being present for that. And he's like, you tell it like it's for entertainment fodder. And, but I, re I reckon they, I know that they, th what it comes down is they were flawed, but they loved me, you know, my bullshit didn't start with them. Theirs didn't start with, you know, right. like they had parents too. They right. had their own set. They were six years old too. And what, what was their life like? And so I never have 
no, I, I love love them dearly. Still hold them very dear. You know, I, I, I'm a parent now. I got two kids, and I always think of that Philip Roth poem. It's a very short poem, and it just goes, "Your parents, they fuck you up. They don't mean to, but they do." That's right. And yeah. I, I just think about that with my kids all the time. You know, you just yeah. I know their what their intentions were. I know yes. where their heart was. Yeah. I know where their heart was, and I can, I have come to understand them so much better, even after their passing, you know, I continue to know them. It's only recently that I've started feeling like, man, I wish I would have realized like how good she was and that I would have been more supportive because she was super talented and it was her passion. She was really, really driven in music and super gifted. And I see it so clearly now how good she was. A savant on the mandolin could like just rip Mm -hmm. and, she didn't get enough credit, and wow. I wish I wish that I would have been more supportive and complimentary and encouraging of her. I think when she picked up the guitar and would sing, I would I was like, oh, here comes you know, and then here's going to come Daddy in, and yeah. you know his ego and his monsters, and this is not going to end well. You go off and you're studying accounting as the middle finger, maybe a middle finger to your parents, and then, uh, but then you end up coming back to music. What what brings you back in? Um, the job sucked really bad. Corporate, uh, corporate environment and corporate culture was stifling at a level that I was not prepared for, um, or or did not have the disposition for. Um, you know, in college, I could study and and make the grades in the classes and get the degrees and all that stuff. None of that was a problem, but there's a certain amount of freedom, mm-hmm. you know. And the corporate environment, the rigid, uh, it was Price Waterhouse Cooper, so it was um, really long hours, getting farmed out on long audits, pouring over books, just zero place to breathe. And the people that I worked with, you know, I always thought I can do any kind of job. It's more about who I'm doing it with. Mm -hmm. Just not, I was just a different bird. You know, I wore clothes that didn't fit in right. Um, It just, it was a bad fit for me. It was, I was dying there. And so on a fluke, because I had messed around at some writer's nights when I first moved to town, before I started that gig, I had met a guy that worked at ASCAP and he was like, this guy needs a, a traditional country singer girl with that kind of voice to do this re-sing some old demos it was like well I'll go in on my lunch you know and see when I'm in town so I did and and I sang a song that I have written in college and he offered me a publishing deal on the spot wow then I tried to figure out how I was going to make it work um I had to get rid of my apartment and I lived at the publishing company um for three years on like a fold-out like little couch thing. <laughs> you, you literally lived there at, at the building where you would write during the because day? Because it was the old Warner Brothers building. There was the top floor, the corner where we had, there was an old funky shower. Mm-hmm. So I had a place that I could, you know, I had a shower and I just, you know, I, I don't know. I got rid of my apartment. I got rid of the guy I was dating. Um, I had a, a wealthy a cousin that had gone from janitor at AG Edwards to partner at AG Edwards. And he was a massive music fan and he paid off one of my student loans. Mm-hmm. And I just figured out how to go from the 40 grand or so I was making mm-hmm. to start there to, I think my draw was $18,000 a year. So I figured out how to cut back where I could live on that. Wow. <laughs> and, and were you, so we, you, you're sleeping there, you take a shower, drink a cup of coffee in the morning, and then are you, what, writing eight hours a day or writing a few hours a day? What, what did your days look like at that point? <laughs> Some of that. I mean, it was a little bit of a party scene up there. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we had a good time. Yeah. And I mean, I was a student as much as anything else. You know, I had a lot to learn. I came from a place where musically it was a little culturally devoid of uh certain things you know i knew mainstream country music i knew some old classic country music and i knew some bluegrass music yeah 
Um, and then I knew the pop music that happened when I was, you know, coming of age, Prince and Michael Jackson and Madonna and all those things. Mm -hmm. um, but I was not aware of the sort of tiers of people that exist in this business operating at different levels. So sort of my education began on them. Mm -hmm. um, and the guy that signed me had designs on being a producer. So we started writing songs towards cutting demo sessions and booking players that would comprise a record, a okay. record. And that's what we did. And we made the blue record that, that we put out ourselves in 1999. And that got me the deal on Atlantic. Gotcha. Got, so what were you, you said you had a lot to learn. Um, what were you learning writing wise and, and musically from the people that, that were around you? <clears throat> you know, I think, it's hard, but like, because when I look back now, it's like I've, I'm just a slow, late bloomer. I feel like, um, just the practicing of the craft. But the people that I was around, they were good at it. And and at that time too, I was trying to write for what I thought I was supposed to do, which was be uh, get a major label record deal. That was the holy grail. Right. That was the only thing that you could see really that was viable to do. There was nothing else to do. You know, there was no infrastructure around, you know, touring really um, outside of like being a mainstream. That was my only example of what to do. So we were riding towards that. Um, but all the while admiring and, and learning about Nancy Griffith and Kelly Willis and Shelby Lynn and um, people that I just really felt drawn to and learning about Towns and Guy and Steve and uh, Rodney, mm -hmm. um, that whole crew. So I th and I just didn't know I wasn't evolved enough as a writer to marry those two things, and still am not. <laughs> evidently, gotcha. But, yeah, but, but it's um, almost as if you were learning a different way forward. Besides, like, okay, well, I could be Shania Twain with a tour that does twelve buses and goes to arenas. But hey, there's this whole other crew of people that are playing theaters and larger clubs and they're doing it in a van with a trailer some of them and and all that you didn't even know that that existed no no gotcha. no and i mean i i spent so many years not playing guitar not really writing songs not performing mm -hmm. that i didn't feel prepared and it felt like you know they wanted my first gig to be the cma awards and i begged atlantic to like instead of spending crazy money on a video like get a van and let me get a band and let me like circle the country a couple of times. I knew I needed to, I, it, yeah. I wanted, I knew I wasn't good enough. I knew I wasn't, but I was getting the deals. Yeah. You know? It's funny. Uh, so the deal eventually falls apart with Atlantic and you hit a point where you're literally having to work another job to put out um, your, your next record. Is it called this side of the moon? The next yeah. One? yeah. And so, yeah, I think I was, I did two jobs in between my ability to make a living just in music. It, one, I waited tables and then I sold shoes at a fancy ladies store in Bill Mead. So I think I was at the waiting tables gig when I got a, I got a call that my old business manager from my publishing deals had way overpaid the IRS and I was going to get like $7,000 return. All right. And then I booked a festival overseas on a fluke that was going to pay me a lot of money and yeah. I needed merch for it. So I totally stole my Warner Chapel demos, combed through those, picked the best of, had a photo shoot with some girlfriends. Disc makers exist by this time. <laughs> so you can send in your artwork and your masters and yeah. buy a thousand records. Mm hmm so that's what I did. And so that was this side of the moon. And then as my publishing deal, which staggered going away after the record deals, um, I went to Pete Fisher, who at that time was the general manager of the Grand Ole Opry. And I had played the Opry so much. And I wanted him to know that it's like, I'm not through, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, here's this record. This is, this is one I'm putting out and I'm going to like figure out a way to keep doing this and stay in the game. What, and he, what kept you pushing through at that time? Because, I mean, I think a lot of people would just be like, man, I had my shot, now I'm waiting tables again. Maybe this isn't for me. What kept you pushing through? I think lack of knowing what else to do. 
Yeah. Um, what else I could do? And I felt so invested at that at that point. I felt pretty invested. I learned a lot. It had been, God, you know, three or four years in the trenches of publishing deals and record deals. I had a ton of relationships. I was playing the Opry still all the time. Right. And he said, there was this guy just in here. And they're starting like a distribution company for artists like you, where you are the your label, but they are providing like the services that a label would. And it was David Macias okay. and 30 Tigers. And um, so I met David at an old Irish pub that was next door to the exit in at the time. And he was interviewing a, a receptionist, like somebody to answer the phones at 30 Tigers. <laughs> and um, he's like, yep, this is exactly what we're trying to do. So they kind of reprinted up this side of the moon. And then um, I was still having to work straight jobs. I got the shoe gig. But um, then I wrote, sometimes it takes balls to be a woman. And Nancy Griffith took me on tour with her. And, oh, um, wow. It just slowly, like I slowly phased out the shoe gig. Um, and balls did well. And then that set me up for welder. And then I made so welder. Was that um was that your first serious uh touring was with Nancy Griffith? Like obviously you'd played gigs and stuff before, but was that your first uh serious dip of the toe into that world? Yeah. I'd never been on a bus tour before. What was uh, that like for you? Oh, it was unreal. I mean, I think out of the gate, the first thing we did was three nights sold out at the Birchmere. Oh, it's so fun. I wrote, I, I played as a duo that opened with my husband at the time and we rode on the bus with them. They bought our hotel rooms. Like she was so incredibly supportive and generous. It's insane. Wow. It's insane. I still can't believe she did that for me. Um, I, I meet Rodney. Rodney makes the balls out. Rodney Crowell, he makes mm -hmm. the balls album. Mm -hmm. And then, then that was like... <laughs> This sounds so archaic, but it was the MySpace era and I had started like writing blogs on MySpace and really like writing prose and it changed my writing style a lot or impacted it. And then I was writing songs like Heroin Addict Sister and El Camino and like things with denser lyrics. I wasn't trying to have the cute country quips. I wasn't trying to write solid, neat, clean country songs anymore. Um, and so the, my writing got more interesting and... Um, Don was came on and we made welder in 2010. It's so, I mean, what's interesting to me about that is, you know, writing the prose on just some random platform like MySpace. That just seems like something that you wanted to do on a creative lark. It wasn't going to earn you any money. wasn't going to get you any notoriety. And yet um, that's what ends up being the richest uh, creatively. That's what ends up giving you a voice. In and the way. creative lark is everything. Yeah. It's everything. And I I have to do it on those terms or not at all. Yeah. Now. I have to do it that way. Um, yeah, I mean I mean I remember I was just write blogs about, man, I'm really mad at the band that went on before me at the five spot because they took <laughs> too long and they started late or whatever, you yeah. know, and just yeah, just spewing but I worked on them and, mm -hmm. and I remember getting criticized for the amount of time that I spent writing my little blog post. Um, but I was working, I was writing, I was honing. And then, yeah, and it really impacted how I wrote songs. You know, hey, doggy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have a big old junk dog. He's stretching out. He's going to like let one rip any minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. For me on the creative lark thing, the older I get, the more I realize if I'm interested in doing something um, and that thing that I'm interested in is not just, you know, straight up boozing or playing video games, it's probably, it's probably positive. You know, if I, if I'm interested just to follow the interest, even if I don't know where it's leading. Um, Cause otherwise if I just feel like, all right, well, I'm going to go write Joe Pug record number six, I guess I'll sit down and do my homework here and finish yeah. this. I mean, you just really end up with some pretty uninspired stuff. It you know? is totally. I mean, I, 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 my happy place is acting on inspiration yep. and it, that can be in the kitchen. It can be in my closet. It can be with some like craft project, which I'm horrible at. Um, it can be decorating a room in my house, building a shrine to something, yeah. um, making a gift basket for somebody. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. And, you know, just all those goofy things, but it's all comes from this kind of muse that I'll ride. And that's, 
that's my life force, you know, is, is, uh, that place. No one else has ever had a career like Elizabeth's. It's absolutely singular. She didn't go the pop country route, though it sounds like she could have. She was making Americana albums in East Nashville a cool decade before the whole rest of the world was. She's explored different mediums like radio, television, and blogging simply because she found them interesting and compelling. You carve out your own path like that by listening intently to your own creative conscience, your still small voice, even when there's a lot of other noise that seems more rewarding and expedient. Reflecting on her creative path made me think of a poem by Mary Oliver entitled Wild Geese. It really captures the terror and the exhilaration of following that creative conscience. Wild Geese. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese, high in the clean blue air, are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. So after you put out Welder, there there was a, a bit of a it took a while for your next record to come out because you experienced just a, a horrible run of, of personal tragedies, a bunch of deaths in your family, uh, a, a fire at a family farm, a divorce. Um, can you kind of speak to how you got through that portion of your life uh, creatively? Yeah, well, the first disrupt that happened sort of on the front cusp of that was I went on David Letterman and and that was real out of the blue because I'd started doing the radio show for Sirius XM and he was a fan and he wanted to do a couch interview with me. This was completely out of the blue. We, it was, um, nobody saw it coming. It was very, very random. Mm -hmm. So I'm just like going, I, I went down to my brother's little beach place and was going to write the follow up to Welder and finish songs. And the first day that I was there, we fired my booking agent and David Letterman called. And then it was just on. I went on Letterman. I got a sitcom deal with CBS. Um, started getting acting gigs. The money in TV world is dumb. Um, I was splitting time <laughs> in LA. Yeah, I mean, I got nephews and trailers that, you know, trying to get through college. Like, I, you know, I was yeah. like, yeah, it's like, you want... You want how much to hold my talent and I'll make yeah. how much a week if I do this sitcom? Like, you know, we broke ass. Like, yeah, I'll do yeah. that. Um, there's a ceiling on being an Americana star. I hit it and bounced off. So <laughs> I uh, that took a long time. So it was really about 2014 then when the tragedies started mm. happening, just one after another and like what was three month intervals really. And then, uh, yeah, there was the faded Americana Awards of 2014 that landed me in rehab. And um, I had gotten a, a new boyfriend. I was divorced, and I had a new boyfriend, and he was a really good producer, guitar mm -hmm. player. And um, I started writing with him, and that's what became Exodus of Venus that came out in 2016. So, yeah, six years between those records. Man, take me a little bit more into that uh, that that TV world. Did, how far did you get along uh, uh, developing a pilot? Um, they ordered the pilot to be written, 
Okay. So there's these different levels of achieve. You know, they they can order a pilot. They have to order the pilot. They order the script, I guess. So they ordered the script, and then they shoot a certain number of those, and then they make six episodes of a certain number of those. So there's like mm-hmm. these tiers that you have to meet. So they ordered the pilot to be scripted, and then we didn't shoot it. We never shot it. Um, yeah, it was wild. It was a wild time. I was I was rolling deep in L.A., and my writer was a guy that had written on Roseanne, and he was great, and he was he was really challenged. It's, it's amazing, the parallels, too, between – Hollywood and the music business like he said this is this is a deal for CBS CBS was paying him something crazy like $250,000 to write the pilot yeah the money is staggering oh my god and, and it's dumb it's I got dumb. in the wrong fucking business and he, man. and he saw me and I mean he flew to Nashville and like he saw like my parents live in a trailer like how poor you know broke as we are and he really wanted it to work and he said yeah. for this to air on CBS I have to write it super broad Okay. Joe. And um, he's like, it's not going to feel, you know, arty to you probably, right. or even super funny to you. And he's like, but I'm trying to get them to pick it up. So I'm trying to marry these two things, your gotcha. courts and then, you know, what they'll actually take to air. Yeah. Um, it's like go, trying to get a song on radio, you know. Right. So he, he was great. He was great. I made so many friends too. There were, because the, then even after that, once you've sort of infiltrated at that level, then it was one network after another. You know, I worked my way down. It was, you know, TLC and A&E and um, <laughs> CMT and this reality show or this game show or this, you know. Yeah. And and I'm, I'm having a great time in L.A. <laughs> uh, I like Johnny Knoxville at the Chateau in the afternoon, striking greyhounds. It was great, you know. Just, Yeah. And so music got put on the back burner and that was such a shame because I was, I was on a trajectory with Welder, but it made me really determined to not do that again. After Exodus, I was like, I don't know. That sounds yeah. like a pretty good season of life. I think if, <laughs> if you have the opportunity to spend a couple of years in LA, just drinking Greyhounds in the afternoon while someone writes a sitcom about your life, I think you, you pretty much got to go with that. I did it. I know. Yeah. I had a great time. I don't, yeah, I really don't regret that part. It, <laughs> Um, but it, but it, it's, you know, how hard it is to get momentum and make, and have yeah. a, I should make impact. And I had that moment with Welder and I needed to make my, I felt like I needed to make a trifecta of records that sort of planted me yes um, to move forward. And I didn't, I didn't, I got, it's so I funny. Got, you say trifecta of records. I feel the same way. I feel like if you put out a really good record, then the next thing you have to do is put out another one so that people can discover the first one. It, yes, it makes any sense. Like welder, everybody wants to talk about welder now. It's right. hilarious. Yeah, it's hilarious. I'm like, oh my god, and it's such like a baby record to me when I listen to it too. Yeah. Oh. Um, what's your perspective? On, you, you were able to speak so eloquently about how the music business worked when you first got into it, and how kind of uh, how kind of sleazy it was with the payola. What is your thought then on the streaming platforms and, and Spotify where it's it's basically impossible to influence uh, getting on those playlists, which are the equivalent of airplay? Yeah, you know, woof, it's like politi- political influence. Here we are again. Yeah. And so it begins again. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's so dense with output. Like, mm-hmm. it's how do you, how do you get attention? I don't know. I yeah. really don't. I, I, like, I'm just like driven to do like the best work I can do yeah. and hope that that with what I've done in the past has me propped up enough to have people's attention to notice it. And word of mouth is powerful. Internet is powerful. Nice. Um, social media is powerful. Um, it can be done, but yeah, it's scary. It's like, how do I, how do I make waves on YouTube when there's, you know, a million videos uploaded a day? And, um, and when all anyone wants to watch is other people playing video games. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I think all those things are important. I still think what's amazing is a live show. If you play a live show and at some point you really touch someone's heart uh, during a live show, that person never forgets about it ever. Right. You know, right. they will be a fan for life. Not to say that they'll be at every show when you come through town, but they'll always be aware when you come through town, if you touch their heart, 
you know. Yeah, absolutely. I, I forget it. I don't know if it was Bill Anderson or maybe like some great philosopher said it, but you know, the the word about you people may not like remember uh-huh. your name or how, where you met or how you met, but they'll remember how you made them feel. Yeah. And so I like when you can make somebody have a uh-huh. feeling, that's yes. that's what you remember. That's it. I remember the first time I saw Billy Joe Shaver play, it was at a very small little chapel uh, for a thing at South by Southwest. And I'd always loved his music, but then to see him play those songs back to back with his, his band, uh, I mean, I'll just, I'll always be aware of what Billy Joe Shaver is up to now because of what he did to me, you know? And, and Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's like, he, well, he sort of wrote, he wrote himself into your history. Yeah. You know, by doing that. And that's what people do. Um, they give you something that sort of rides along with you. They, uh, they make a shift and adjustment in your emotional trajectory and yeah. in really the blink of an eye. It's so powerful. Music's so powerful. Getting people to listen, like that's that's hard. No. It is. It, I, I, I certainly do not um, envy people who are breaking into business right now. Um, what is the next, what does your next phase look like? Are you going to make a bunch of records? Are you going to produce other people's records? Are you going to lean into the radio thing? Are you going to go back to LA and drink Greyhounds? What's coming up <laughs> for you next? We'll see. Um, definitely going to make some more records. Yeah. Uh, so I've, I've, uh, got one we'll be talking about before too long, I imagine. And then I'm writing for another one. Um, and I'm, I feel really good about it. I feel like, I don't know. I finally feel like my own critic is starting to like what I'm doing a little bit. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that's like really gratifying because I have been really hard on myself for a long time. Yeah. And, um, really leaning into what feels good and seeing that translate and make other people feel good. It's like, uh, it feels like maybe I'm finally catching the tiger by the tail a little bit, maybe. And so I want to swing it around if I can. Um, so you feel like you're being, my- you're able to be less critical of yourself now and that's helpful or have you just gotten better at writing? So the critic has less to say. I, I think I've gotten better at writing and I think I have gotten better at editing. I think I've yeah. gotten better at like knowing where the weak spots are knowing what's effective and what's not and um, really calming and making sure that I'm doing it how I want to do it. And I, I went really hard on Exodus in my writing there because I think I was in so much emotional turmoil that I leaned on researching things and finding poetic ways to say what was actually happening so I think the next record will be more like a marriage between Welder and Exodus. It's a little more forthright and mm-hmm. lyrically. Um, but, you know, on Exodus, I was researching voodoo deities and name dropping them in verses. And, and, and people up to people's ears, I'm, I'm just making sounds like there's no way that they, you know, I was like, what's the oldest French cocktail? Like, um, and what does, and what, you know, I can write Sazerac. So Sazerac, that's cool. So, um, so yeah, I, I would just like research and even Exodus of Venus itself is like about, you know, correlating the passing of a planet through the earth's atmosphere to a book in the Bible. Sure. Know? Um, so well, and you're right, I really, you're- I really went hard on, reading and researching and finding ways to to get those songs out and what I was feeling Mm -hmm. through some sort of I guess metaphors that were hopefully deep and entertaining well and and presumably that had some uh some reference to what you were going through at that time I mean when I hear you say uh you're writing a song about you know finally deciding that you were going to stick somewhere and and stand your ground I mean it sounds like that Sure, you were writing about a woman at her house in Katrina, but it sounds like right. you were writing about a fair amount of stuff in your own life at that time. Yeah, right. Totally. It was like, it was trying to take control back, I think. Yeah. Like, I, you know, you can't, you can't shake me now. Yeah. You know, you can't, you can't shake me now. And Dharma Gate, you know, knowing a relationship is doomed. Knowing yeah. the relationship that I was in was doomed. Knowing that it was. But knowing that I was going to try it and go through the paces of it anyway. And Dharma gate being like a Buddhist term for the gateless gate. 
makes, you mm-hmm. know, just bizarre. And that Lucifer was actually the name of a female constellation. Like that's where the name came from. Really? Um, Lucifer. But now we know it as like one of the names for the devil. Yeah. And correlating to that to like how little we really can understand anyway. Mm-hmm. So why not? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm going to get in this relationship and it's going to suck. <laughs> well, you know, I guess you could call that the gateless gate, but knowing how something's going to end then going through it anyway, when I was in playwriting, that's what we used to call a tragedy. Um <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's Romeo and Juliet, right? Like at the start of ah. Romeo and Juliet, at the prologue, they say, look, this is how it's going to go. This is, they're both going to end up dead at the end. They tell you exactly how it's going to happen. And then we as audience members, we watch it. And for a moment there, we always feel like uh, Romeo and Juliet won't die at the end, if it's acted well, you know, if it's yeah. a good production. Yeah, uh, yeah. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah, yeah, it's neat. Shakespeare is pretty good, huh? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, Right on. I, I'm I'm so grateful that you you took the time to uh, to jump on our little program here. I've always just really admired from afar. You've really built this iconoclastic, amazing thing that's like nothing else anyone has ever done, man. I, I just think it's so cool, uh, Elizabeth. I'm so flattered by your interest um, because I came to know of you in a south at a South by Southwest. I think we were both at, and I wanted yeah. to see you really bad. You were playing like a chapel or something. Yeah. 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 And I, I was there. I wasn't at the gig. I wanted to be really bad. And I can remember, um, really feeling like I needed to see you Why and not? wanted to see you and, and didn't get to that time. <laughs> Great rapping with you. And, uh, I'll, next time I'm in Nashville, I'll, I'll drop your line or I'll keep an eye on your schedule. Hope to run into you sometime. Thanks Joe. Bye. Bye. That's our show for this month. Thank you so much for being here. This month's show was brought to you by Banzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. Use promo code TWS, the initials of our podcast, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. Elizabeth Cook's latest album is entitled Exodus of Venus, available everywhere music is sold or streamed, and her radio show, Elizabeth Cook's Apron Strings, can be heard on weekdays from 12 to 4 on XM Radio's Outlaw Country Channel. If before we meet again, you sit down to write, please remember, an expensive drug habit is not a song, a compelling Instagram account is not a song, and most importantly, reverb is not a song. So, Let all that take care of itself, and for you, just keep your eye on the song.